On the phone, we have a coaching legend. This gentleman won three national championships at Oklahoma. He also won a Super Bowl with the Cowboys, one of the greatest coaches in college and NFL history, Barry Switzer. How are you doing, Coach? Fine, David. That's, thank you. It's very nice of you to say those things. I don't believe them, but uh, I was fortunate <laughs> to coach the two programs that had good players, and uh, we were able to win. You learned from a pretty good coach, too, though, at Arkansas and Frank Broyles. Well, I, I, I did. I was surrounded by an excellent staff. I think we all learned from who we coach with and our mentors. And I think back on my beginning uh, some 60 some years ago that uh, that uh, when I started playing the game and, and coaching the game, it was around, uh, I think, the best. I had great tutors and good, outstanding coaching minds that I learned from and took a lot of things that uh, – they provided for me and gave to me, and uh, I, you know, filtered some, and uh, and you end up the product of what you are. I mean, you go to college, you learn from your professors, and I had the best professors in football and uh, uh, along the way. So uh, I think that didn't head me in good, helped me in good stead along the way in winning the programs I was involved with. When you were in high school, was Jack Mitchell the guy recruiting you? From- Jack Mitchell recruited. He was an All American quarterback at Oklahoma in the forties, late forties. Uh, I actually recruited under Bowden Wyatt, who uh, went on to Tennessee. He had only coached a couple of years at Arkansas in the early fifties, and uh, went back to his home uh, state uh, to back to his school. He played at Tennessee. He played for Coach Joe Malin and Bob Malin, and uh, he took the Tennessee job. I was recruited by his staff. Then Frank. Then the uh, uh, Jack Mitchell came in and uh, ended up the recruiting process. Signed with Arkansas, uh, played three years for Jack Mitchell, and then Frank came my junior year in 1958, and uh, which was the best thing that ever happened to me because if I had Frank Bowles come into my life, I don't know whether I'd ever got into coaching. But Frank came in my life. Uh, we ended up winning the uh, Southwest Conference Championship my senior year in Arkansas. I was the captain of the team. Uh, Frank uh, wanted me to join his staff right after that uh, and live in the dorm and coach and scout. And uh, so I, I intended to go to law school, but he asked me to try it for one year. I could always go to law school the next year. Both didn't mix and uh, wouldn't have enough time for law school my being on the road recruiting and traveling and scouting and all that. So uh, we know the rest of the story. I never got to law school. What sort of lawyer would you have been? <laughs> we got too damn many lawyers in that. <laughs> uh, I, I would probably be one of those guys helping the little guy. Uh, I wouldn't have... Uh, I wouldn't be in New York or Chicago, probably. I'd probably be in the, somewhere back in Arkansas, probably Little Rock and uh, our Fayetteville area, where Walmart and the Sam's and all of them are today, Tyson's, uh, some of the giant corporations in the country. But no, uh, I, uh, I never regretted it. I had the opportunity to coach, and Frank gave it to me, and uh, and I look back on that, and I know that uh, you, you know, a lot of the crossroads you come in your life, you don't know what road you take. Uh, you're influenced by a lot of factors, and thank goodness that uh, Frank Bowles was there for me and uh, gave me the opportunity, and I chose it, and it's been a good path I traveled. It seemed like Coach Broyles just knew how to pick quality assistants because a ton of his assistants became successful college coaches. Well, he, he did have that ability. He had uh, he was a very highly intelligent person. He uh, still alive today. He's nearly ninety years of age. But Frank had the uh, lives in Pebble. Uh He knew that you surround yourself with good people and good things happen. And I've always had that philosophy. I tried to surround myself with good people, let them coach and uh, and treat them right, respect them, and uh, and then good things will happen for you. And uh, I did that. You, you take care of them, and you, then you, in college, you go out and recruit them, and you recruit them. You, you love them like they're your family, and they're an extension of your family, and uh, which they are. And uh, actually, you recruit them, you got them for life, they're yours for life, and uh, and they're part of your family. So uh, uh, they they will play for you and win for you, and uh, you treat them all the same and take care of them. When Jim McKenzie was named the Oklahoma coach. Was it a difficult decision for you to leave Arkansas? At any point, did no. you say, you know, if I stick around a few more years, Broyles will be gone? 
<laughs> no, I never thought that. I, I was too young to believe that. Frank was only 30-something years of age at that time. And uh, uh, I'd already been off. Uh, Dickie had gone to Tennessee. He had offered me a job to come with him to Tennessee back in the early 60s. Hayden Fry had left our staff, went to SMU. Uh, he wanted me to come with him. I was off the, the defensive coordinator's job with him. Uh, there were a couple of other jobs I interviewed uh, that I turned, well, I actually didn't get involved in that much. I wasn't offered the jobs, but there were good experience for me. My uh, being uh, had the opportunity when I was coaching Arkansas to interview for them. But uh, uh, I knew that I was going to leave with Jim McKenzie. And, uh, and uh, Jim and I were very close, and I, he was really my mentor. I spent more time with him and I believed in him and I knew he'd be very successful. And uh, when he got the Oklahoma job, uh, I knew I was going with him. I was the first coach he hired. And uh, I was the sec- first coach to, other than him to arrive in Norman, Oklahoma. He arrived in Norman, Oklahoma on January the 1st, 1966. I arrived on January 3rd, 1966, and uh, which uh, was 48, 49 years ago. You had a pretty good receiver down there at Arkansas, and Lance Allworth. Was there any temptation to make him a running back? Well, Lance did play running back uh, through his career at Arkansas. Remember, this was an era when the ball wasn't thrown that much, but he caught a lot of passes coming out of the backfield. We did use him as a flanker, and he had the great speed uh, and uh, great hands, so he made some plays in the passing game for us and pump returns. But he was a running back. Uh, the other back we had was actually a better runner and made All-Americans, and Moody was the best back, but Lance was the, the best athlete. He had the great speed and great hands and fit perfectly in the pro football when it came his time. He was actually 20 years ahead of himself. He was okay with Mississippi. Mississippi at the time, Johnny Vaught wouldn't take a married player. Lance was married coming out of high school, and uh, – Johnny Vaught had this rule at at the Ole Miss that uh, he wouldn't take a married player. So uh, Arkansas benefited from that, and Frank Boyles was able to bring him to um, Arkansas, and uh, I was able to play with him my senior year. When I was a senior, Lance was a uh, was a uh, sophomore. Any thought of you playing professional football? My playing professional football? Yeah. No, I didn't have the size or ability to play professional football. No, not at all. But uh, I, it was a different era back then. We didn't have the size uh, that these guys have today. We didn't have the products that are produced today. There's only about 120 million people in the country in that time. We didn't have the population. And we had, in the end, just all coaching attitudes that, you, you know, you, you you didn't lift weights. You, you lose your quickness. You become muscle bound. You couldn't have, you couldn't be, wouldn't be able to run. So those type of attitudes existed back then. We didn't have any strength and conditional programs. I played about 200 pounds, 205, and uh, uh, six one and a half. And I could run. And I could play linebacker. Well, we played both ways back then. You played defense first, and that put you in some position on offense. And uh, and it was an era when they there were wasn't much scoring. Seven three in ball games, seven to nothing ball games, three to nothing ball games, fourteen to seven. Very few games you scored over 28 points in because the defense and the kicking game were prominent, uh, prominent back then. It wasn't much offense. Everybody kind of kept from beating themselves and uh, played the kicking game in field position. You had two guys on uh, who played for Arkansas when you were coaching there, and uh, Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson. Did you ever think to yourself, you know what, I might be intertwined with these guys later on in life? Well, no, you never think that. I knew that... Uh, uh, I liked them both. I uh, knew them both well. I uh, knew them from the time they were 17 years old. I was coaching uh, at Arkansas. Jerry came from Rose City, uh, Arkansas, and that's right outside North Little Rock. And uh, he was a fullback when he came out of high school, uh, early 60s. And uh, Jim, uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson came out of Port Arthur Lincoln High School. Uh, not Lincoln. That's where my great running backs, Joe Washington, came from. It was the black segregated school at that time. Now, he came from Port Arthur Jefferson High School and, uh, and came, to Oklahoma, um, came to Arkansas and played nose guard there. So uh, I got to, had the opportunity to coach both of them, know both of them when I was at uh, Arkansas. And, uh, and when Jerry came to Oklahoma in the early 70s, I was head coach at Oklahoma at this time, and he was making his uh, fortune in oil and gas business. And, 
and Jimmy was in coaching, and that was on my staff at this time. And uh, uh, J- Jimmy coached at Oklahoma for four years, well, actually three seasons, and left in his fourth year when I was the head coach here at Oklahoma. So, no, I never thought we'd all be together like that, but we've been socially close, uh, associated for the, all this time. When Jim McKenzie had, had his fatal heart attack, what, what was the impact on you? Well, obviously it was devastating. I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, Jim was close uh, to me, and uh, I uh, had no idea what we would do. I, it was up to the president of the university. He named Chuck Fairbanks as the head coach. But I didn't worry about that so much. I knew I could go back to Arkansas. I could go back to coach with Frank Rawls or Doug Dickey or someone would hire me of uh, the Arkansas family. I didn't think about myself. I thought about Sue McKenzie and the McKenzie family and about how unfortunate someone's 37 years old to die that young and uh, and was going to be a great success at Oklahoma. He was a big head coach of the year, his first year here. We beat Texas. They hadn't beaten Texas in eight years. That's the reason we were hired. That Oklahoma had not beat Texas for eight years. We beat Texas the first year Jim was here. We beat uh, nine and one Nebraska. Uh, Bob Devaney's team uh, and Norman on national television, 10 to 9. Uh, and, you know, big upset, but we were pretty good. We coached them up pretty good in our first year. And uh, and Jim was the big eight coach of the year. And uh, so it was uh, devastating to us. And Chuck Fairbanks was named head coach. And after Chuck took the pro job and went on the New England Patriots side, I was given the job here at Oklahoma. If- would you have been ready at age 29 or whatever it was? No, I don't think I was ready then. You know, I was uh, uh, coaching offense uh, at that time. I was the first year as an offensive coordinator. And uh, I was coaching offensive line when Jim died. I was uh, coaching the, what we run, run at Arkansas, Arkansas playbook. Jim, I wanted to coach defense. And Jim asked me to stay on offense to help uh, with Homer Rice, who hadn't ever run the Arkansas offense, I offense. And uh, so I stayed on offense, and Jim died. I was going to go to defense the next year. And uh, because of his death, uh, Fairbanks wanted me to stay on the offensive side, side and run the offense and be uh, offensive coordinator. So I did that, and uh, it was that until uh, uh, he left and went to pro football about five, six years later. Was it hard taking over the program following in Bud Wilkinson's, in essence, footsteps? I mean, there was a couple coaches after him, but no one had the success he did. Well, there was actually only one well, one coach that was after him, and that was uh, uh, Gomer Jones, who was on his staff. He had two losing seasons, and that's why we came in here, and uh, uh, Jim McKenzie got the job, and we won that year. Then. Then uh, we the next year we uh, nearly won the national championship. We were ten and one and beat Tennessee in the Orange Bowl, and uh, uh, we had we I think we ended up number three in the country. So we brought him back in a hurry with the players that were already here on this team. Freshmen weren't eligible at the time, so freshmen couldn't play. So we were winning with the players that were already here. Whose decision was it to feature the wishbone offense? Well, I. <laughs> I watched Texas all the time run the offense. They were no longer running it. It was a great uh, scheme. It's a great philosophy. Uh, I would look at a lot of film with Texas. I'd watch uh, our defense prepare for them, and, and I'd sit in there with the, their staff. And uh, I happened to be here with Pat James, an outstanding defensive coach, and uh, he talked about how difficult it was to line up against the wishbone and defend it. And uh, I tried to talk Chuck into going to it instead of the split back beer after Steve Owens had graduated but was a Heisman Trophy winner running the I formation. It was an I back after he graduated. Chuck wanted to go to the split back beer that Houston was running. I said, Chuck, we need to run the wishbone with the backs we have, uh, the quarterback we have in Jack Meldrum. We need to be running the option game. And, uh, and Chuck didn't want to have any part to do with it, but after a dismal start the next year, I was able to convince uh, Chuck uh, that we needed to uh, transfer change to the that wishbone offense, and we were able to do it. And uh, next thing, uh, we were on our way. We were a great team from then on, and uh, we got better and better every time we played. 
with that offense, you just needed the three running backs. You didn't have to worry about your receivers. Well, we had one receiver, but they were good receivers. They were first round pick, uh, and uh, Billy Brooks was a first round pick of Cincinnati Bengals, and Tinker Owens played uh, five or six years in the Orleans Saints. So the guys we had wide were really good, so they made big plays. And uh, of course, um, the option game is predicated off the uh, triple option is running offense, and some games we never had to throw the football. We just rack up five or six hundred yards rushing and control the ball and. And get their defense tired and uh, score a lot of points. I remember that seventy-one team. I remember the game against Nebraska, and I know what it was like to watch that game on television. What was it like to be on the sidelines for, for the game well, of the century? Well, it was uh, back and forth, and we led at the half, seventeen fourteen, and. Uh, then we had a drive to go ahead and with 30 seconds left in the game, we were leading the ball game. Then Nebraska uh, took a drive. They got midfield. It was a fourth down and six at midfield. And uh, uh, their quarterback was grabbed by Sugar Bear Hamilton, who played about 12 years in the NFL, still coaching the NFL today. Raymond Hamilton grabbed his uh, the quarterback, Jerry Taggy. He's got who looks like he's going to sack him and take him down. But sack it. Jerry Attack gets one arm loose and throws a sidearm pass that uh, Johnny Rogers dives and catches for about an eight yard gain to give him a first down. That play right there haunts me because if uh, that play hadn't been made, we win the ball game. We take the ball and run out the clock. But uh, they made three or four more plays, got the ball to the four, three, four yard line, and they were able to score with Kenny putting in the end zone with uh, no time left. So. It was a great game. Uh, two great teams, both were undefeated and ended up being ranked one and two in the country. And uh, they both dismantled our Orange Bowl and Sugar Bowl opponents. They dismantled Bear Bryant's Alabama pretty good. Nebraska, and we dismantled Auburn pretty good in the uh, Sugar Bowl. So we ended up one and two in the country. When you won that first national championship, how fulfilling was that? Well, I, it's, I knew we were good when we, uh, and I inherited this football team. I knew we were going to be good. Uh, we were undefeated my first year. We were undefeated my second year. We won two national championships back to back. And probably if we'd made the field goal at Southern Cal with the, le- uh, in the fourth quarter from the 11 yard line, we missed a, a field goal from the 11 yard line in the fourth quarter that would have won the game. And had we made that, we might have won three consecutive national championships. We won 74 and 75. We might have won 73 instead of ending up three in the country. We'd beat the Southern Cal that day. I think we would have won three in a row. Who was the best running back you had? Well, I've had a lot of great running backs. I I know. I I had uh, one that didn't stay long, Marcus Dupree, only about a year, as good as any. But... uh, uh, the ones that stuck it out, I'd have to say, Billy Sims, Greg Pruitt, Joe Washington. That's three of them right there I can name. You know, Greg Pruitt played 13 years in the NFL. Uh, Joe Washington played 10. Uh, Billy Sims played five, but blew out of me. Or he had been one of those backs that rushed for 15,000 yards in his career. He was first player to pick and draft, was NFL Rookie of the Year. He was a great back. You don't win the Heisman Trophy by accident. No, you don't. You got to be good. And he was the the best player in the country two years in a row. He won the Heisman as a junior. Could have come out that year, but he didn't. And came and back got his degree and uh, and uh, should have won the Heisman that year too. He was the first player picked in NFL Rookie of the Year. Your defense wasn't too shabby too, though, in the mid seventies. I mean, you had the uh, seven you brothers. Bet. You bet. In seventy four defense, we led the nation in defense. No one scored more than 14 points on us, and uh, uh, all eight of my defensive starters started in the NFL. Eight of them started in the NFL when there was only 26 teams playing in the NFL. So that's how talented we were. Had three Selman brothers that uh, dominated. Uh, when they played, we were 54. I think we were 54-3 and two. 54 victories, three losses, and two ties, two national championships, and four Big Eight conference championships. So, uh, we, yeah, we were we were dominant dominant football team. As you mentioned, the OU Texas game is probably the biggest game on the schedule for either team. 
Was did you have a favorite OU Texas game? Well, my first one. My well, first one was when uh, we played Daryl Wall and um, Cotton Bowl, and uh, uh, we beat them, hung half a hundred on them. We put uh, fifty-two, and they got thirteen. So it's probably my best one. But we were we were a better team. They went ten and one that year. I saw a game they lost. They were good too, but uh, we were we were really good. Were you the key? To the success of Oklahoma, or was it your chief? Recruiter? No, no. I had a great staff. I had good players. I give credit where credit's due. I was, I did my job. I did a good job at my job being the head coach and preparing our team, our coaches, and our players getting them ready to play. But we had a lot of coaches doing their jobs too, and their players doing their jobs. So yeah, I was in charge of the family, and uh, I was uh, yeah, captain of the ship. So I guess I might keep it to the wind and I did a good job of that. You know, I got to co- say this, in 16 years we coached at Oklahoma. Uh, when I coached here, no one has accomplished or won like we won since. since. And uh, no one did that uh, uh, since 1947 when Frank Lee had Notre Dame. We won 84% of our games and no one has won at that pace since in that 16 years we coached here at Oklahoma. And you beat the best coaches around. I mean, no one had a winning record against you. Twelve and five against Osborne, Jimmy Johnson. You were five and three. Bobby Bowden never beat you, and you even beat Woody Hayes. Yeah, and Paterno. You know, it's uh, you know, we had uh, I, we were good, and it's I was always say the reason we beat them, we were very good. So uh, we were just a talented football team at that era, that time. I came along at the right time. I, I was recruiting black quarterbacks for other people recruiting black athletes. And uh, I was uh, I knocked down walls and doors and, uh, and or I was doing the right thing before anybody else was doing the right thing. So I feel good about that. And I uh, was able, because of that, to, to do some things that uh, helped me down the road that, uh, that really uh, led to my success. Did you get a lot of heat for recruiting uh, black quarterbacks? No, you hear something back in the in the seventies, you know, early seventies. You you heard that from stupid dumbasses, but it never bothered me. I didn't pay any attention to it. My players didn't pay any attention to it. I didn't care, you know. And so, uh, and they didn't either. We you know we were family, close, tight knit family. We didn't care. We had a job to do, and we were going to do it. So simple as that. In recruiting J. C. Watts, did you get to get a, a word in edgewise, or did he? <laughs> he's pretty good talking now. Yes, he is. Yeah, he's he's very good. I knew he was gonna be a great politician. But uh hey no, I had I had a lot of great quarterbacks, Thomas Lott, him I started with Kerry Jackson back in nineteen seventy one, but uh no, I actually I tried to co- uh, recruit Tony Dungy in nineteen seventy two out of uh, Jackson to, uh Michigan. I went to his home, visiting his home with his mom and dad and I, I really had Tony interested uh, but we went to the Thirty limit that year, and uh, we had already committed all of our thirty scholarships. And uh, January it changed on us, so Tony, we we had to kind of back off Tony because we already had our scholarship numbers. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, it was a it was a good run, and uh, had a lot of great players along the way. They made it happen. When they, but I helped because they didn't fall out of the sky and land in Norman, Oklahoma. I had to go get. Them. You know, so you got to make it happen. So I had, uh, I always didn't want to out coach my, my, my opponents. I didn't want to say I was a good coach. I just wanted to out recruit them. So uh, if I had the better player. Most of the time, I'm going to win football games. Did you ever think about leaving Oklahoma to go to the NFL before you joined the Cowboys? I had an opportunity in 1976 to go to Kansas City with Lamar Hunt's team. I was, uh, was coached with the uh, Kansas City organization. They wanted me to come visit and talk to me about the taking a job. I changed my mind. They had a jet plane going to pick me up, and I had canceled it. Uh, I didn't want to affect my recruiting class. I was doing, having a great year of recruiting, and I uh, didn't want to dis- disrupt that with competition and find out about it. And I didn't want to lose some kids, and we just won the national championship in two consecutive years, and I was having another great year of recruiting, and I didn't want to affect it. Who was the the one recruit that you that didn't land? The one that got away that you wish you'd been able to to bring to Oklahoma? Without a doubt, Earl Campbell. I thought we were going to get Earl Campbell. 
went to Texas, was a great player, Heisman Trophy winner, NFL Hall of Fame. We all know what Earl he was. He was one of the great ones. And had to compete against him at Texas, but he's the one that got away that always won. I mean, they, w- they wouldn't let him out of this, past the uh, Texas-Oklahoma border, I would think. There's, there's no way. Yeah, he Tyler, got Tyler, Texas is not very far. Tyler's close <laughs> to the Norman. It is to Austin, I promise you. <laughs> when you took over the Cowboys, did you know what you were in for replacing Jimmy Johnson? Excuse me, I didn't hear that. Maybe. Did you realize what you were in for replacing Jimmy Johnson as the coach? Of the oh, Cowboys? yeah, I knew it was going to be a tough job. I was the only one. I didn't get to bring the staff. I was the only one that arrived. You know, I had to take over Jimmy's staff, inherit his football team. You know, uh, you got a football team that's upset. You got the uh, coaching staff that doesn't want to know one thing about me. Uh, Jerry's the only one knew me, and, and he trusted me and knew I'd be loyal to him. And, uh, that was uh, the only important thing because he's the guy who owns the football team and makes the decisions. But I had a tough job going in there, and uh, all I asked him to do was give me a chance, guys. And uh, I didn't have anything to do with this divorce between these two guys. I, so uh, I had nothing to do with that. Just let's uh, keep the thing going down the road. I know how to win. I won a lot of football games, and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make it happen, which we did. Did you know what it would be like working under – Jerry Jones? I enjoyed it. It was a great a great situation for me. I had a great time. Everybody, Jerry gets a bad rap. Jerry never interfered with me. I never had a problem with Jerry. Uh, we had a great One thing I missed about Dallas has not been around him and Steven and Lacewell and those guys. Uh, we had a great time together. It was fun. He, he wasn't on the sidelines telling you what place to call? No, hell no. He's on the sidelines, but he never told me what. Hell, the cheerleaders on the sideline. They had Bozo and everybody down there. Yeah, it was crowded, but uh, Jerry never told me what the hell to do. Now, first of all, he didn't know what the hell to do. You know, he, he never coached. He, I had coaches to, uh, to make those decisions. We made those decisions, not Jerry. And so it, the media creates that crap. The media doesn't know what the hell. They had never covered a kickoff or bought one back either. So uh, at least Jerry's done that. But no, he never interfered. What's bigger, Oklahoma football or Dallas Cowboy football? Well, there's nothing bigger than the Super Bowl. That's the biggest stage in, in uh, sports. There's no bigger stage in sports than the Super Bowl. And, um, you know, obviously it's huge, but Oklahoma football is huge, too. It's one of the top three or four programs in America. And uh, so, uh, you know, you're at the top of the collegiate game when you're at Oklahoma. When you're at the Cowboys, you're, you're one of 32, and it's got a great tradition. They won five Super Bowls. And we won one of them when I was there. Yeah, and they they don't give you a very long leash with the Cowboys either if you don't win. If those fans down there, uh, to put it politely, are nuts. Well, they're that, they're that way everywhere. It's not <laughs> unique to the Cowboys. Was there any temptation to go back to college football after the Cowboys? No, no, no. Never thought about it. Never had to consider it. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't today. I might want to enjoy my fourth quarter. I'm going to call my own plays. I'm going to do it from Norman, Oklahoma. I've got 10 grandchildren setting up with, right within a mile of me. And uh, I'm right here on the campus of the University of Oklahoma. So it's pretty good right now. How did you get into the the wine business? Uh, I drank a lot of it. That's why. I, I like <laughs> Cabernet Sauvignon. I like going to Napa. And uh, we started a wine by 07. And uh we do a good Cabernet. It's Napa Valley, Oakville, and uh, I only produce enough about a thousand cases. We sell it in Oklahoma, and Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Dallas, and that's about the only three cities we sell it all in those three cities. But it's a good Cabernet. If you ever get down this part of the country, they uh, share a bottle with you. Your dad was in the liquor business too, from what I read. Now he's a bootlegger, you know. <laughs> My dad was a bootlegger in the 50s, back in the 40s and 50s. Of course, he did it in the illegal, illegal county. It was a dry county, and it was illegal. So he, he ended up going to prison because of it. But uh, I knew that uh, that I, I can always go back to cry. The county's still dry. I can always go back there and make a living time to get cut. <laughs> I, 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 I can bootleg whiskey just like my daddy. And if I went to prison, I know what job I'd want. He always told me if I went to prison, make sure that you feed the rabbits. That's what he did. They don't feed them chicken. It takes too much room to raise chickens. They raise rabbits in, the, in boxes and crates. 
rabbits. Daddy fed the rabbits, and uh, the rest of the guys picked all that cotton out in front of those, that farm there in the Mississippi Delta in South Arkansas. Uh, that was a long time ago. What was life like growing up? Well, it's typical like anybody. I lived in the, my dad being a bootlegger wasn't typical, but uh, I grew up in the South in the 40s and 50s. And, uh, and it was, uh, you lived in the rural country with the black or white. You lived in shotgun houses. You didn't have any electricity. It was coal lamps and privy in the garden and the smokehouse and hog killing time in November. You cut the hog's throat and dipped in water. You scraped him and you cut him up and put him in the smokehouse and cured him. And, and uh, he had meat all fall, but, uh, you know, raised some chickens and had a garden. Everything was organic back in. And, uh, it was, uh, that was a good area. I had a milk cow. I had to pump water damn milk cow every day. I hated the summertime because I drank too damn much water. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was, that's the way it was. You walked to town, you know, you didn't uh, have, when I went to the University of Arkansas in the fifties, we didn't have parking lots. Imagine that. You're not having parking lots because no one had cars. Kids well, didn't have cars. I was going to say, what would you need a parking lot for? That's right. You didn't need a parking lot back then. Well, you're, fa- you're lucky if your family had a damn car. Yeah. You know? Everybody hitchhiked. A road or bus. You know, that was uh, the way it was. You, you've come in, you think of how far you've come now. Like you said, you have your own vineyard and you also own a bank. Could you ever imagine the success that you've achieved? I didn't dream of it, think about it, but because of my success in coaching and all the people I met, I surrounded myself with good people, good talent, and, and that's how I won. And when I got out in the private world and uh, private sector, I used that same philosophy. I surrounded myself with good people, and good things usually happen. And uh, and I'm I'm in the real estate business, the oil and gas business, I'm, uh, in the medical field. I do I do uh, various various. I got 50 LLCs that I'm invested in and. I've done well, but I've won with some and lost with some, just like in football. But I've won, had more winners than losers. What is it with you, Arkansas guys? Jerry Jones, extremely successful. You, Lance Allworth, has made millions with these storage facilities. I, I have about 15 of them across the state of Oklahoma called Switzer Locker Rooms. We, they do pretty well, too. <laughs> and when I first opened them, everybody said, what's Switzer Locker Room? They, they thought it was an adult bookstore. I said, no, it's a, it's a self-storage store. And we do well with those. We'll be able to brand use from the ground up, and uh, their few facilities are all packed. And uh, we, we, we've had a couple out of state, but I didn't uh, didn't put but one down in Oklahoma in Texas, but it was a big one. But I didn't put my name on it. I didn't want anybody to say no, it's fine. <laughs> well, so, there's there's pros and cons to having a very that's distinctive right, last that's name. That's right, because yeah, you, know, you get a few Aggies, Longhorns, and all those guys that care much for us. So. You know, so has Coach Broyles ever taken you golfing at Augusta? You know what? Uh, I, he's asked me many times, and Jack Stevens did, and I finally went down with Joe Ford, who was president of Augusta. Joe's uh, one of our classmates uh, 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 at Arkansas. He's a member of uh, and Steve's son, a member of uh, Augusta. I've been invited many, many times, and I finally – finally went one time. He asked me one day when I was down there at the Masters sitting in Stevens' cabins, he said, Barry, I know you don't care much about golf, but uh, you need to bring your grandson and uh, let's come down here and you and I ride around let them play. And uh, I said, that sounds like a great idea. I said, you know, I'm running out of time and I'm running out of invitations. I'm going to take you up <laughs> on So we went down and stayed in Eisenhower cabin about four days, had a wonderful time. And I've been to the Masters many times, but I'd never gone down there spend any time uh, uh, on the course and uh, and, and, play, and play golf, which I did, and uh, I was able to, you know, enjoy that and uh, stay, stay for three or four days. So it was a, it was a good experience. I'm glad I did it because I was running out of time. Well, you talk about this being the fourth quarter of your life. You do realize there's also overtime. Well, I plan to play overtime. I <laughs> planned uh, not hear the two-minute warning and uh, – I plan to play overtime. I, I try to stay healthy and work out, and I keep my weight the same. I weigh the same. I, hell, I didn't win in college, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm fortunate. I got good genetics, good genes. I'm not talking about Levi's or Wranglers and <laughs> good DNA. 